This chapter will discuss descriptive statistics, literally ways of describing our data mathematically. So basically, descriptive statistics are in essence measures of location. We can get them for a sample or a population. Think of the population um, as the largest possible sample. It contains all possible data points, which is something that's not normally able, uh, something we cannot normally obtain. So from that, we will select a more manageable sample, and then we will gather information from that sample and extrapolate it to describe the population as a whole. And how are we going to describe that? The most common ways, uh, mean is average, median, most, or middle number from your distribution, mode, the number that appears most often in your distribution, um, percentile and quartiles will allow us to describe more the way the distribution looks. So mean is the average of the data values. You'll notice a difference here whether in the notation of whether we have the sample versus the population. So a large n is going to be the total number of observations in the entire population. A small n then is going to be the number that we extrapolate for our sample. And we're going to calculate the average as by taking all of the values, adding them up, and dividing by the number of observations. So that's going to be denoted x bar. Your Excel formula for calculating an average or a mean is average. So let's see an example here. Let's say you are moving to a new town and you need to um, rent an efficiency apartment. So the 70 efficiency apartments were randomly sampled at a small college town. The monthly rent prices for these apartments are listed here. So you went out and you gathered a sample of 70. Presumably there's significantly more efficiency apartments in a college town that are available. And we want to calculate the average rent. So we take all those values together, add them up, and divide by 70. You come up with an average rent of $490.80. So you, that gives you the average, you're paying less than that, you say, okay, I'm paying less than on average. If I'm paying more than that, I say, okay, this is a little more expensive. Or another interpretation of that, you know, someone randomly asks you, how much do I think it's going to cost for me to rent an apartment in this town? Your most common answer would probably be the average. So about $491 a month. Median is the middle value. Uh, it doesn't necessarily tell you so much about how the distribution will look. It's just the middle number within the distribution. So when we think about distributions, we think of our standard normal distribution where our mean is the most common um, appearing number or you know close they cluster around the mean. Think of the standard normal distribution, the bell curve, that kind of thing that you're more familiar with. We'll use the mean relative to this median, this middle number, in order to describe how our data looks, whether we're skewed more towards larger numbers or skewed more towards smaller numbers. And we'll talk about that um, when we look at um, the z-score calculation and skewness as we go along. So median, basically just the middle number. Um, the steps here describe how to calculate it by hand, so arrange your observation smallest to largest or largest to smallest and then pick out the middle number if you have an odd number of observations if you have an even number of observations it's the average of the middle two numbers so here's this example um, the median rent in this college town go is uh, $475 the smallest rent is 425 and the most expensive rent is 615 Mode is the number that occurs most frequently. Um, if something is bimodal, it has um, two numbers that occur at, of equal frequency, multimodal, three observations that occur of, or three or more observations that occur of equal frequency, that kind of thing. So mode, the most common um, rent price from this sample is $450 per month for that efficiency apartment. So that would be, mode would be the interpretation of that would be the most common observation. So the most commonly appearing rent is 
percentiles. Percentiles um, provide information about how the data is spread over an interval from largest to smallest. If you're going to do this by hand, you would arrange the data from smallest to largest and then um, let the percentile of interest equal i. i would be equal to um, p divided by 100 times n. So n is your number of observations. p that would be, let's say you wanted the 90th percentile, p would be 0.9. And then it's going to give you i. I is not actually going to be the percentile that you're looking for. It's going to be the location in the order. So I'll have to show you that um, printed out, you know, in an example that we go through in Excel. That's kind of the by doing it by hand method. If you're going to do this in Excel, the formula is percentile. You highlight your data, comma, percent. So you would highlight all of your data and then comma 0.9 for the 90th percentile. Um, for, so the 90th percentile would tell you, say, 90% of apartments have a rent less than that. Or, um, you know, 10% of apartments have a rent greater than that if, say, you'd calculated the 90th percentile. So here's an example. We wanted the 80th percentile. And just calculating this using, um, using Excel, it's going to give you $535. So the 80th percentile tells us that 80% of apartments' rent are less than or equal to $535 per month, or 20% of apartments have rents that are greater than that amount. Now, what is the... Uh, so that's telling you, you know, essentially your, your rent, if it is $535 a month, is in the upper range. Now, what is all of this that I have written in here? Okay, so 80 divided by 100, that's that 0.8, times 70. So there were 70 observations. So what is the 80th percentile of those 70 observations? That's what this is calculating here. So 0.8 times 70 is going to give me 56. Now remember, the first step was to take all of your observations and arrange them smallest to largest. So my smallest number was 425, my largest number was 615. So that 56 that that gives me, that's the 56th observation here. And that tells me that my 80th percentile of apartment rents is observation number 56. So observation number 56 is $535. And then my interpretation goes the same way as it did before. Quartiles. Um, there's four quartiles. Think of a quarter. There's, you know, um, a quarter. There are four quarters make up a dollar. So the general way that you would normally think of quartiles. And these are basically specific percentages. So the first quartile is the bottom 25%. The second quartile would be the median, that, those first 50%. The third quartile, 75%. Um, and then the fourth quartile would be the entire data set. So the Excel formula would be quartile. Then you would highlight the data, comma, one, two, or three. So I can ask you either for, if I asked you for the 20th, 25th percentile, you could either use the percentile formula or the quartile formula and put in one here. Measures of variability would be range, variance, and standard deviation. So next we're moving into how we describe how our data is spread out over our d entire distribution. Range is the difference between the largest and smallest numbers in our data set. The interquartile range is something that we're going to be using to do a box plot that we'll talk about later. The interquartile range of a data set is the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile. So in our apartment example, um, the range goes from highest rents of $615 to lowest monthly rent of $425. So that tells us there's a $190 
spread in monthly rents in this town. Okay. Variance is a measure of the variability that uses all of our data. It's based on the difference between the value of each observation and its mean. So at first when we look at this variance calculation, it looks kind of scary. Um, we'll talk about this in class more, how this works, but essentially um, for the sample variance, we have the summation, so that means add everything up, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to take each observation minus the mean, and we're going to square that. So variance is the sum of squared deviations from the mean. It's a measure of variability or a measure of scatter around that average. So if you think average is what, my, the, what I expect a value to be, the variance kind of tells me how much that can scatter around that expectation. So a uh, higher variance would mean there's more scattering around that expectation. A lower variance would mean that there's less scattering around that expectation. So a wider variance or higher variance means our data is more widely distributed. A smaller variance, it's more clumped in there. So our Excel formula is VAR, and then you would highlight your data, and it's going to give you that variance. Now, people often ask, why are we squaring? Well, think of, um, let's say your mean is a dollar. You have one example that costs a dollar and ten cents, and another example that costs ninety cents. Well, if I were to just take each observation minus the mean and add them up, those two observations would cancel each other out. So, because one is 10 cents above and one is 10 cents below. So we don't want to have observations canceling each other out because that's not, that would be eliminating the appearance of some of the dispersion, right? Because we had some that was a little bit below and some that was a little bit above. But by squaring that, we are going to take away that impact of observations above and below the mean, canceling one another out. So variance is kind of weird because it involves that squaring. So for variance, it would be like when I would calculate that, I would end up with a variance in terms of dollars squared. Now, what is a dollar squared? I have no idea. So standard deviation is a measure in the same units as the data. So it's more easily interpreted than the variance. So for a Stand, for our sample, I would take the square root of that standard, I'm sorry, square root of that variance, and that would give me the standard deviation. I would do the same for the population. It's just going to be a notational difference. So, uh, just like we're, you know, in for average or mean, it was x bar for the sample, mu for the population. For stand, for variance, it's sigma squared for population, s squared for sample. Here we're now going to be S per sample as the standard deviation and um, just a single sigma for standard deviation of the population. And the Excel formula is STDEV. Now the hotels video goes through and shows you these examples, putting it all together so you have another chance to practice with some additional interpretations. That goes through the percentiles, um, and also works through calculating uh, the variance and standard deviation using descriptive statistics. So while I've gone along all this time and shown you how to calculate mean, median, mode, variance, standard deviation, and range mathematically using the Excel formulas, Excel actually has the capacity to do that all in one step um, using the descriptive statistics. So what you would do is go into your data tab, then select analysis, um, data analysis and descriptive statistics, and you'll see a window like this. You would input your data, however it appears. It's usually in a column. It could, however, be in a row, and you'd select um, summary statistics. You can also select confidence level for that mean if you wanted. We'll get into that later. Um, and it would give you an output that gives you all of that data that we had just discussed. Now, 
We talked previously about making histograms, and we said histograms were really important because they gave us a picture of our data. So our picture of our data can be described using the skewness. And skewness is actually going to be one of those things that is printed out in, the, in that descriptive statistics. So what skewness does is allows us to look at a number that would describe the picture of our data. So it allows us to look at one number as opposed to having to go through and do that histogram. So um, if our data is completely symmetric, like in a standard bell curve, we would be looking in this first observation, our skewness would be zero, our um, mean and our median would be equal. Remember, mean, average, median, most commonly occurring number. So our data would look, quote unquote, pretty. It would be symmetric. So skewness would be zero. If we're skewed to the left, we would have negative skewness. Um, the mean is going to be less than the median. If we're skewed to the right, we're going to have positive skewness mean greater than the median. So it's just kind of showing us how our data would shift to, um, but without causing us to have to go through and draw out that entire um, histogram. So our data is skewed if there are either more observations above or below the mean. So if we're skewed, think back to our apartment's rent example, um, if we're skewed either more towards more expensive apartments or cheaper apartments. So we'll look at this skewness here. We have a positive skewness. Our mean is greater than our median. We're actually going to be skewed more towards the cheaper rents here. So there are more cheaper efficiency apartments in this town um, than there are more expensive ones. We're, we're skewed more towards the cheaper end. Okay, so now what if you wanted to know um, is my apartment rent kind of an outlier. How does that work? We can use something called a z-score. Now what did I mean by an outlier? I meant like uniquely cheap or uniquely expensive. We can use um, the standard normal distribution in order to see do we have an outlier. So a z-score denotes the number of standard deviations that data is from the mean. According to you know, statistical analysis that has been performed. If we're following a standard normal distribution, so in this case we're looking here at a population overall, so we're using mu's, but this would work the same way for our sample using x bars and s's versus mu's and sigmas. Um, 80, or sorry, 68 point, roughly 25 percent of the population, or of the deep, the of observations will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. Roughly 95% of observations would fall within two standard deviations of the mean. And roughly 99% of observations would fall within three standard deviations of the mean. Now what do I mean by within one standard deviation of the mean? So that's one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. So if you notice here, this is mu plus one sigma and this is mu minus one sigma. So that 68% encompasses both observations that are one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. The 95% includes observations that are at the mean plus those that are up to two standard deviations below and up to two standard deviations above. And we'd say in general that um, most of our data would be within the 95 percentile range. So we would end up calling something an outlier um, if it was outside of two standard deviations above or below. And the Excel formula for this is standardized. So an outlier is usually described if it is um, unusually small or unusually large for the data set. The data value of a z-score of less than negative three or greater than positive three would be considered an extreme outlier. If you can see, remember, roughly 99.72% of your data is covered, should be covered within three standard deviations. So a value um, outside of three standard deviations is going to be really, really high. Um, so if we can look here, these are the z-scores. 
for our apartment rent. And if we go by the um, by two standard deviation rule, so to cover roughly 99%, we can see that our last two apartment rents, they're um, 2.27 outside, uh, 2.27 standard deviations outside of your mean. So that's a little bit, um, that would say they're kind of uniquely expensive. Um, they're outside of the other 95% of your data. Um, and they're, I'm saying they're more expensive because this is in the positive range. So 95% would be within a z-score of two, 99% would be within a z-score of three. So if we're looking for extreme outliers, nothing's greater or greater than or less than three here. So nothing is outside of the 99% range. However, these two values of 2.27, those are greater than two. Um, so they're gonna be on the upper range of your uh, prices there. Now this can be positive or negative. So a number less than negative two would be a, um, would be a cheaper outlier towards the um, to the bottom end of our range here. A box plot. A box plot is a visual summary of your data. Now they're kind of uh, they're very popular in the social sciences. You'll see these used very often in um, psychology information I've seen. But what's kind of annoying is that Excel doesn't have a default function for going ahead and calculating or depicting a box plot for you. However, you can use Excel to figure out this five number summary of your data and to calculate the things that are necessary in order to create your box plot. So we need, the box plot will cover the smallest number, the largest number, the first quartile, the third quartile, and the median. It'll also incorporate something called the interquartile range, which is the difference between the first quartile and the third quartile. So you can use Excel to find this information. Um, the minimum and maximum are automatic, and median are automatically calculated in descriptive statistics, or you could go through and use the functions min and max. Um, quartile one, you would highlight your data, comma one. Quartile three, highlight your data, comma three. And then to get the median, you could use the median function there. So how would we draw this? We would draw a box with its ends located at the first and third quartiles. Draw a line indicating the median value within that box. So it doesn't necessarily have to be right in the middle. Remember, it's a median and our data could be skewed. So uh, it could be farther towards that third quartile or closer to that first quartile. Next, you calculate the interquartile range, which is Q3 minus Q1. And then we're going to determine um, whiskers that are going to go out from this box. I know that sounds a little silly, but you might hear this as a box and whisker plot. So whiskers are just going to be like dashed lines that come out of that box. Um, the lower limit would be 1.5 times the interquartile range. So take Q1 and subtract off from that 1.5 times the interquartile range. And for Q3, take for the upper limit, take Q3 and add 1.5 times that interquartile range. And then we would draw dashed lines from the end of that box towards the um, largest and smallest or up, upper and lower limit. And any outlier then would be shown as something that is outside of that um, dashed line. So in our box, in our, I'm sorry, in our apartments example, here's the information. The cheapest rent is $425. Highest rent is $615. First quartile, $445. Third quartile, $525. And median, $475. So our lower limit there would be um, 325 and our upper limit there is going to be 645. So I'm drawing now, sorry, this shouldn't say this, the, yeah, the, I don't know why this is going there. Um, 
this should go out in theory this little dash line should go out all the way to 325 what we did is we stopped here at 425 because that was the lowest rent that we had um, this dash line here does go all the way out uh, or should go all the way out to 645 it stopped here at 615 so in this case there are no outliers because we do not have any observations that are outside of that upper or lower limit. So in a um, box and whiskers plot, it's a visual representation. You would have an outlier if something were outside of that lower limit or outside of that upper limit. So here, they didn't continue out the dashes because there weren't going to be out any outliers because the lower limit went to 325 and the cheapest rent was 425. Um, the upper limit went to 645 and the most expensive rent was 625. So there are no outliers outside of that, um, you know, that limit there that we have. And you'll notice here um, how the box is drawn. So the uh, first quartile we can go back and look there that first quartile was 425 the third quartile is 525 and then that median is located there at 475. next we're going to discuss uh, measures of relationships between data so that would be um, covariance and correlation coefficients so covariance is a measure of how data move together. So it's a measure of a linear association between two variables. A positive covariance would tell us that there's a positive relationship between the two variables. A negative covariance would tell us that there's an inverse relationship between the two variables. So the way this is calculated, it's the sum of each observation minus its mean. So each observation of x minus its mean and each observation of y minus its mean. We add them all up and divide by n minus 1. Um, so there must be an equal number of observations of each data set that you're comparing. And you can use the COVAR function. So it, you know, you'll highlight all of your data if you have them right next to each other. It's nice and easy. Just highlight both columns of data there. So covariance just tells us whether the observations move with each other or against each other. So you might say, you know, something that you would expect to have a positive covariance. The more I study, the higher the grades I get. So that was, are things that you would expect to move together. Um, something that you would expect to move inverse of each other. Um, let's say the colder it gets, the less ice cream cones are purchased. Now, I know there's some people who eat ice cream year round, but for me, it's more of a summer thing. So that no offense to you if you do eat it year round. Um, but that's something that I would think of would have an inverse relationship. So as it gets colder, you consume more ice cream. So covariance just tells you the direction of that relationship. Correlation tells you the strength of that linear relationship. So correlation coefficient can range between negative 1, which would be a strong inverse correlation, or positive 1, a very strong positive correlation. So... Um, Negative 100% would, move, would mean that they're moving in lockstep in opposite direction. Positive 1 would mean they're moving in lockstep in the same direction. And your correlation coefficient can range within there. So 0.5, not really that strong in either direction. Um, 0.9 would be a pretty strong positive correlation. Point, um, negative 0.9, pretty strong negative correlation. So let's see an example here. A golfer is interested in the relationship, if any, between the driving distance and an 18-hole score. So we have information, average driving distance in yards and average 18-hole score that he obtains. Um, so we have here the sample covariance. That's going to be negative 0.7, negative 7.08. So that's going to tell us that they're moving in opposite directions. Um, and then the correlation coefficient of negative 
0.31 tells us that there is a strong connection between those two. Uh, so we have an inverse relationship. As distance increases, score decreases. And then we know that that is, in fact, a strong negative relationship from that correlation coefficient.